We are live. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. This is Minister Paul, a watchman on the wall, coming to you live from Righteous Cry Ministries. Invite you to uh, participate in this Bible study here. You know, we have fellowship. It's so important that in these last days, and we all feel it. Amen. You feel it? You feel it? I feel it. And so, because I feel it, you know, I, I want to gather people here together and I want to dig into his word. Amen. So let, let's start off with some praise and worship music and uh, let people know, you know, we're going to discuss the word of God. Um, I want to let people know that I wanted to do this for a couple of weeks now, actually, and something always comes up and something came up today, too. And I just uh, I just brushed it off because this is important in the time we're in right now to do this and, and the only agenda I have is the truth I'm not trying to find something in the Word of God that's not in here you know uh, just trying to get to the truth because we're seeing all these things happen and we we got to know the truth and we got to stand on the truth so the Lord has it on my heart to do this Bible study so let's play some worship music say hi to everybody enter into a you know a, a presence of thankfulness how many people here woke up and had something to thank god for you know i do a lot of things i'm thankful father we come before you tonight we'll play some worship and Humbly. we're going to go Let's directly to, to the word of god we ask jesus to bless bless this uh Empower our words. this gathering and this fellowship our and this reading of his word our open our, our eyes Open our ears. Help us. I need a touch from you. Amen. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. Amen. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Lord, we praise you, Lord. God bless everybody in, in the room. Manna and Ruth go down the list. Sister Ruth and Brother Buddy. Sister Amber and Brother Al. And Sister Pat. Brother Ricky. Sister Mrs. Elizabeth. Sister Dottie. Brother David. Jesus is, is God. Brother uh, Jawadi, Quail, and Morocco. I'm excited, you know. The enemy, the enemy forms plans to stop us, but they don't prosper. Not in this house, amen. Did I miss anybody? <laughs> I'm excited. Jesus, we praise you, Jesus. Lord, I need you now. I need you today. I need you right now in my life, Lord. Imagine the people right now, if you would, with, with no with no hope. They got no hope. We're here for them, amen. They got no hope. We got to introduce them to the hope. And his name is Jesus, you know. Jesus is our hope. Set us free, Lord. God bless you, Wendy. Let just let the Holy Spirit, just Sister Jody, 
Let the Holy Spirit just come in and just consume the room with His presence. It's nothing but good when Jesus is in it. Come on, Jesus. Come on, Lord Jesus, into this room. We're going to read and study of your word. You're the author of it, Lord. Bless the reading of this word. Bless the people in the room. Bless us with your presence, and we won't leave the same. <laughs> you feel his presence? I feel his presence. It's all good. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Christ and Nazareth, in the name of Jesus Christ and Nazareth, and I anoint my hands, and I anoint my feet, and I put on the full armor of God, overcome by his presence, hey man, how many people want to be overcome by the presence of the Lord Jesus? You know, I must confess that I'm blessed. Sometimes it seems like the whole world against us. But I sit here, I feel blessed. Blessed. Because of one thing, Jesus. He's the reason we're blessed. And he's all we need. Jesus. Jesus matters. Just give us Jesus today. And it'll all be alright. move of God what a mighty move of God upon this world out in that song let me begin by praying and if you all want to pray with me Lord I feel that the Holy Spirit in here it's a blessing to gather together in fellowship with other people in Christ dear Heavenly Father we come before you today to seek the truth to seek your word to, to inquire or inquire in your temple and receive knowledge and grace for grace. Lord, we ask that, you know, your wisdom and your knowledge and, and your understanding of your word just open up to us today. It's so important. Open up your word to us, Lord. It's, it's, it's meaning as you meant it to be when you wrote it. And open our eyes and open our ears. And when we call in people that don't even know you to watch this message and see the urgency of the time we're in. We ask that you would bless the reading of this word. And I ask that you would bless everybody within the sound of my voice and everybody in the fellowship box, Lord. It's here for you and you alone. 
We seek the truth today. Would you reveal it to us, Lord? In your most holy and heavenly name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. So, it's going to be a pretty good format. I'm going to read the uh, the introduction in my Bible to uh, the, the, the second epistle of Paul to the Thessalonians. I'm going to read. We're going to start off. We're going to read what the letter is uh, about in the intro. Amen. And uh, I'll try to stay focused on this one is what I'll do. So it says, since Paul's first letter, because this is 2 Thessalonians letter, there is a 1 Thessalonians. It says, since Paul's first letter, now watch this. The seeds of false doctrine have been sown among the Thessalonians. In other words, he wrote a first letter, but since then, seeds of false doctrine, and that's a key word, seeds. Seeds of false doctrine has been sown. You know, Jesus talked about sowing seeds, right? Among the Thessalonians, causing them to waver in their faith. Paul removes these destructive seeds and again plants the seeds of truth. So we know that what we're going to study today is the truth. Line upon line. He begins by commending the believers on their faithfulness in the midst of persecution and encouraging them that present suffering will be repaid with future glory. Present suffering will be repaid with future glory. Amen. Therefore, in the midst of persecution, expectation can be high. Paul then deals with the central matter of his letter. A misunderstanding spawned by false teachers regarding the coming day of the Lord. Despite reports to the contrary, that day has not yet come. And Paul recounts the events that must take place, laboring for the gospel rather than lazy resignation is the proper response when dealing with the gospel. As the second letter in Paul Thessalonian correspondence, this was entitled Pros. Pros Thessalonians B, uh, you know, part B, otherwise known as the second to the Thessalonians. That's from my authorized King James Bible here in the intro. Amen. And so now what I want to do is we're going to go. I have a side by side King James to Thessalonians 2. And uh, I'll put a link. That's what I'll do. I'll put a link here. Give me a second. I'll show you what I'm doing so we can all can be doing the same thing. Amen. I, I want you to see everything I'm looking at. And then I'll put it in the description box for people who view this later as a video. So w what I have up here is... Uh, Second Thessalonians 2, side by side, in the Greek Amplified and the King James, to get a deeper rev revelation of that. And uh, so I'll show you kind of what that looks like. I'll put it in the chat box. This is a, and then I'll, I'll put you a link to the, the Bible study. So there's a link. So we're on, we're all on the same page. And then I'm gonna put a link to the, uh, to the Bible study. And we're gonna we're gonna bounce back and forth. Uh, get his name here. It's really good. I, I've used this person before on uh, the book of Jude. He actually does the whole entire Bible in here, but for today's purposes, it's going to be uh, Second Thessalonians two. So there's that link that we'll be using make sure we're on the right chapter and then we're going to cross reference with an expert using this link amen so praise the lord so that's that in there so second uh, thessalonians 2 in the king james it says now we beseech you brethren that's people already saved the brothers and sisters in the lord by the coming of our lord jesus christ and by our gathering together unto him, 
Verse 2, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that day of Christ is at hand. I'll read it in the Amplified. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 1 and 2. And, and it says, Now in regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to meet him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to be quickly unsettled or alarmed either by a so-called prophetic revelation or spirit of a message or a letter alleged to be from us. In other words, not from us. Alleged to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has already come. And verse 3 says, Let no one in any way deceive or entrap you, for that day will not come unless the apostasy comes. First, now watch this. This is the Greek. First, that is, the great rebellion, the abandonment of the faith by professed Christians, and the man of lawlessness revealed, the son of destruction, the Antichrist, the one who is destined to be destroyed. So now we're going to go over to the Bible study. We just, we just did line by line, verse 1, 2, and 3. So now I'm going to switch over to the Bible study. There's a link in there. And uh, we're going to see uh, what, what, what expert theologians say about this. Uh, verse 1 and 2 says, Paul's comfort to the troubled Thessalonians in their question. And then, and, then, uh, and then he says in regard to concerning the, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, it says, Paul here addressed questions raised by his first letter where he instructed the Thessalonians about the catching away of the church to be with Jesus. So in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5, the Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak about the church being caught up. And then they had questions regarding this and began to think that it already happened and they missed it. And let's apply this to this day of 2016 here, you know, uh, how, how we feel. And so he's addressing their questions about the catching away. So everybody with me so far? Which is in 1 Thessalonians, especially 4 or 5. So the challenge is understanding this chapter comes from the fact that it's a supplement to what Paul has already taught. It's a supplement. 2 Thessalonians 2 is a supplement to 1 Thessalonians. I'm not adding to anything. But Lord, show us the truth. Yet the ideas are clear enough if we carefully piece them together. Because we weren't there. We don't know exactly what Paul said to them other than what's recorded here. We weren't there. And then and it says, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus and our gathering together with him, the notes on this say, Paul clear wrote of the return of Jesus, line by line, precept upon precept, hallelujah, everybody, the, uh, as is recorded as to be Bereans of the word, to study it, the whole council, and, so, and the whole word of God. So, so he, he's talking about a difference. Watch this. He's making a distinct difference between the coming and our gatherings. The scripture says concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus and also our gathering together with him. So this strongly suggests that there are essentially two comings of Jesus. And can I get an amen? One is coming for his church. And this is described in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18. Let me get this in the box. The, the one he's describing uh, Jesus coming for his church. And the, and the cross reference of this is 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18. Lest there be any, uh, you know, confusion, which, you know, confusion is not of the Lord. And so... Uh, and it says, and the other coming is with, is with, okay, so Jesus coming, here's two key words, watch this, for and with. So Jesus is coming once for his church, and then Jesus is coming again later with his church. Two different events, right there in the word of God, isn't this amazing? 
So there are two parts to this great event. And let me see if I can give you any cross references too. I'll give you cross references. Matthew 24, different world conditions are described. So, so we're taking into account what Jesus prophesied about in Matthew 24 and uh, Luke 21 and about the world conditions and, the, and them being two distinct separate events. A lot of people don't want to hear this, but we're going to read it directly from the Word of God. So in Matthew 24 it, it, and uh, in Revelation 6, and different approaches of Christ to the earth. L let me get this on the official record. And if anybody wants to post scriptures, please do. Hey, Brother Ron, God bless you. Okay. There's different approaches of Christ to the earth. They're described in this. 1 Thessalonians 4.16, Revelation 19.11. So they're two different things. And there's different scenarios regarding the predictability of the date of Jesus' return in Matthew 24, 36 and Daniel 12, 11. And I'm glad this is recording as an archive because it'll be a video to be reviewed again and again. And then he says, we ask you to not be soon shaken in mind or troubled. Now, it says a misunderstanding apparently of Paul's teaching or an incorrect application of his teaching had caused the Thessalonians to be, quote, shaken in mind and troubled. Here Paul used a strong wording speaking of both a sudden jolt, a shaken in mind is a sudden jolt, and a continuous state of upset, trouble. Those are the two words he used. Their fears, now watch this, this, to me, I've read this three times, I've been studying this two weeks, to me this is amazing stuff that needs to go out. There's a lot of nonsense going out, and the truth, more truth like this needs to go out. Uh, it, the, the, the fears of the Thessalonians that this is being written to, centered on the idea that the day of Christ had already came, and they missed it. They thought when this letter was being written that Jesus Christ had already came and they missed it. And they were spreading this as a false doctrine. Uh, the word to be shaken signifies to be agitated. And it says as a ship at sea in a storm and strongly marks the confusion and distress which the Thessalonians had felt in their false apprehension of this coming of Christ. So in te 2 Thessalonians 2.2 2, it says the day of the Lord, watch this, rather than the day of Christ. The day of the Lord is a concept with a rich Old Testament background and was mentioned in Paul's previous letter to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 5. In regards to the day of the Lord, he addressed that in 1 Thessalonians 5. It is not a single day. We're talking, let's let's. Let's stay on track here. The day of the Lord is not a single day. It says uh, it, it's a period associated with God's outpouring of judgment and the deliverance of God's people. A significant aspect of the day of the Lord is throughout the great tribulation that we're not in yet. See, people, and I continue to come on here and use the word of God to show this to be true. We are not in the great tribulation yet. So the sixth seal hasn't been opened. You with me? We're sticking to facts here. Uh, and, and this is cross-reference of this is Matthew 24, 1 through 31. And then it says, as, the de as though the day of Christ had come. Their fear was that the day of Christ had come, right? And, uh, and it says, uh, the King James says that the day of Christ is at hand. And then uh, the Thessalonians were not afraid. Now listen, the Thessalonians that received this letter, they were not afraid that the day of Christ was coming in the future. They were afraid they were living in it, which is being taught a lot right now, that we're already living in it when it hasn't happened. We're just repeating that, not me personally, but we are living in, uh, uh, we're seeing on YouTube these videos and teachings that are not coming from the Word of God that we're living in a time that hasn't happened yet. And this is the same challenge they faced over 2,000 years ago. You with me? Nothing new to God. But if we stick to the Word of God as our roadmap, then we can't be swayed. So, because it uses it as a verb to, quote, to be at hand, uh, 
and, and, it, and it's talking about to the effect that the day of the Lord is present, not at hand. So in other words, in the Greek, it would say that the day of the Lord is present, already here, not at hand. So uh, I'm going to give you some cross references of this uh, word being present. When we, when we take the term being present, I'm going to give you some cross references to study this being present in the Greek. And, and it's eight, uh, Romans 8.38. And 1 Corinthians 3.22. And, from, and then it says the things to come. So it talks about present time and things to come. It makes a direct distinction between them in Greek, which the New Testament was written in, in Greek. So from this, it's obvious that the day of Christ had not been completed. And Paul's going to go on here as we read on to demonstrate that it also had not yet dawned because the Thessalonians were afraid that they were already in the great tribulation, the day of the Lord. So what this is saying is that the day of the Lord is great tribulation is when day, the day of the Lord is, is when great tribulation happens. And a lot of people teaching this right now. Well, let, let, let's go forward and, and see. Did I see Gail up in here? I think my wife's in the meeting, but if she pops up, let me know. Uh, so it says, so they feared, here, here, is, here is why 2 Thessalonians was written. Because Paul wrote about uh, the catching away of the church in 1 Thessalonians. Now they had a bunch of questions. They have fear that they missed it. They didn't want to miss the catching away. So he's writing the second letter to tell them, no, it hasn't happened yet. Because, and I'm going to quote this, it says, Paul will demonstrate that it's impossible that they are in the day of Christ because if, 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 if they were in the day of Christ, then certain signs would have to be present. I'm going to say this. If we're in the open seals and... and uh, and uh, and the rapture has already occurred, and we're in we're we're in great tribulation. Then certain signs would have had to have happened. You can't have one without the other. And the signs are what Jesus warned of uh, in Matthew 24 and in the book of the Revelation. These signs that Jesus warned of, what shall be the sign of the coming? They hadn't all happened yet when he wrote this, and so it was impossible for them to be in the great tribulation. So what they're saying here is uh, uh, Paul had clearly taught them. Now watch this. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 14 through 18, the Apostle Paul through the Holy Spirit clearly taught that they would escape. Someone quote me on this. They would escape God's judgment on this earth during the period known, known as the day of the Lord or the day of Christ. He taught them that they would escape that. And you know what? We will escape it too. Hallelujah. We will escape this. And then it says either by spirit or by word or by letter. We're still in the first three scriptures. Okay. Perhaps the troubling word had come through a misguided prophecy. That's why it says spirit. Uh, or perhaps some other leader wrote them a letter, and that says that's why it says by word, that they were already in the day of Christ. Either way, whether it came by a, a false prophecy or a false letter, they were in fear and upset the idea that they'd somehow missed the rapture. Missed the rapture. That was their fear. So here are some signs that would mark the coming day and it says let no one deceive you by any means now here we're going to really break down some true some truth it says let no one deceive you verse 3 i believe this is by any means and what did jesus say in matthew 24 he said take heed that no man deceive you you see the bible doesn't contradict contradict itself people do so for that day the day of the Lord, not the rapture, the day of the Lord. Can we distinguish those two? Capital D will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Okay, so let's break this down. For that day will not come. 
Paul will not describe events which must precede the rapture, but events that are concrete evidence of the great tribulation. So he's going to show you things in this, this epistle that, uh, that are revolving around the great tribulation and show you, in my opinion, that the rapture is before the great tribulation. So uh, unless... Unless anybody out here can prove that all of Jesus' signs have been fulfilled, all of them, including the Antichrist sitting in the temple and all of that stuff, unless someone can 100% prove that all of those things Jesus warned about as a sign of his coming has happened, which they can't, well then it hasn't happened yet. We're not in the Great Tribulation where you know the rapture hasn't happened. The, the wrath of God isn't started yet because of what Jesus said. Amen? Because of what Jesus said. This phrase is not... In, okay, so... For that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. Now, let's get this. The ancient Greek word used here for falling away indicates a rebellion or a departure. Bible scholars continue to debate if it refers to a, a, a rebellion against those who once followed God or a general worldwide rebellion. So in fact, Paul may have both in mind because there is evidence of each of these in the end times. And I'll give you some scriptures as to whether it's a worldwide rebellion or just a, you know, those who follow God rebellion. 1 Timothy 4, 1, 2 Timothy 3, 1, and 2 Timothy 4. But so the, the point of the Apostle Paul, the Holy, the Holy Spirit's point is in this letter here is clear as day. You are worried that we are in great tribulation and that you missed the rapture, but you can know that we are not in great tribulation because we have not seen the falling away that comes first. This is what he was writing to them. And let the Holy Spirit have his way. This is what he was writing to them. And it talks about Revelation 9 and Revelation 17 and Revelation 7 and how they all stand by side, side by side in regards to great tribulation. Okay, now let's get to the Antichrist. The Antichrist referred to as the man of sin. And it says, and the man of sin is revealed. Pay very careful, close attention. According to 2 Thessalonians 2, the man... Uh, the man of sin uh, cannot be revealed let me go down here Let, let's go back a little bit we can know right now in real time that we are not in the great tribulation which is right after the six seals are open we're not in that because the man of sin has not been revealed and we're talking about revealed in full power a lot of us have uh, ideas and revelation about who the man of sin may be but he's not full of satan operating in full authority and showing miracle signs that he's not he's not you know a world leader yet and so Let me go past some of this stuff. It's very plain and clear that the man of sin being ref referenced here is an individual who come to great prominence in the very last days. This is how it's always been understood. The fathers understood the Antichrist to be intended as Daniel described. An individual person. So let's be clear on that. That uh, We can cross-reference Daniel 9 and Daniel 8 and Daniel 11 that the Antichrist is an individual person. 
See, that's why we need all of the Bible. Uh, the prince who is to come, Daniel 9, 26. The king of fierce countenance, Daniel 8, 23. And the willful king, Daniel 11, 36 through 45. Jesus described an individual person. It's Jesus wrote in John 5, 43, that the one who comes, quote from Jesus, in his own name. So it's a man. So we're not surprised that the Apostle Paul here is describing this man of sin as an individual person. It's not a system. It's a person. So we have now established the fact through the prophet Daniel and Jesus himself that the Antichrist is a person, right? The man of sin is a prominent figure in the Bible and the ultimate personification of the spirit of the Antichrist spoken of in 1 John 4, 2 and 3. He will no doubt live many years before the Great Tribulation, but he will only be, quote, revealed as the man of sin during that period. The idea behind the title man of sin is that sin has so absolute dominion over him that he becomes the very embodiment of sin. Now, I, I you know, to, to, to people who operate in the prophetic, they can receive the advanced revelation of who this man is, according to Amos 3, 7. And I have my own belief, and so do many others, on who the man of sin is. But what, what I want to preach and teach here through the word of God is that he's not fully operating as the antichrist he's operating in an antichrist spirit but he's not not operating as the antichrist yet not yet he's very close but it's not it's impossible for him to be doing this yes because it wouldn't line up with scripture the son of perdition translates to the doomed one i'm going to say that again the son of perdition translates to the doomed one and so everybody say yes and amen he's doomed so what the man of sin does, we, we can see through this chapter what the, the, what the Antichrist will do. It's amazing. He will oppose and exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. We're, I believe we're in chapter 4 now. The man of sin will demand worship for himself that belongs only to God. He'll do that. Luke 4, 8, cross-reference. This demand for worship is clearly described in Revelation 13. We're talking about the Antichrist. I, I, I really like this part right here by Clark. He says, understanding the strength and breadth of this statement shows us that saying the Antichrist is the Pope. Let me address this right now. There's a lot of people teaching the Antichrist is the Pope. The Antichrist is not a Pope. The Antichrist is a, a world political leader on the scene, not a religious leader. The false prophet is a religious leader. And I don't understand this simple concept being misconstrued. Even here in the Bible study, it says the Antichrist is not the Pope. The, uh, the, he will sponsor a religion that does not tolerate the worship of anyone or anything except himself. The Roman Catholic Church will be a part of this end times religion, but the Pope is not the Antichrist. Notice that the meaning of these words cannot be cannot by any probability be fulfilled by anyone who has the Pope creates object of worships and thus by inference makes himself greater than the objects which he creates. But it is required that the Antichrist will set himself, the person, not statues and stuff like this, himself. He will set himself up as an object of worship above and superior to everything uh, that is called God or worshiped as God. He's going to set. Okay, here's here's a key that the Holy Spirit just dropped in my spirit. Satan 
tried to exalt himself above God in heaven before any of us were ever born, and God kicked him out. And now he's down here, and he's setting up the same thing where he wants to be worshipped again. But he's doomed. You catch that? So when it says that he's going to sit in the temple of God in chapter, uh, verse 4 rather, it says the man of sin will demand, the man of sins, the Antichrist's man of sin demand for worship will be so extreme, he will set himself up as God in the temple of Jerusalem, demanding blasphemous worship from everyone. Cross this hasn't happened yet. Cross-reference, revelation. So many people want to make things happen that haven't happened yet. Revelation 13, 14, and 15, Matthew 24, 15, uh, Matthew 21, 29 through uh, 31. The temple of God. That this is a literal temple is clear from the text and has been understood as such by the earliest of Christians. But when this Antichrist shall have devastated all things in this world, he will reign for three years and six months. So first of all, the, the, the devastation hasn't occurred yet. The covenant hasn't even been confirmed yet. And, and what this what first and second Thessalonians clearly show is the removal of the church prior to this. That's why I'm going home. Amen. The Lord will come. Now, listen, listen closely. Then the Lord will come from heaven in the clouds in the glory of the Father, sending the Santa Christ man and those who follow him into the lake of fire, but bringing in for the righteous the times of the kingdom. The literal understanding of Apostle Paul's words is supported by the fact that when he wrote this letter, something similar to this almost happened in the recent past. The recent attempt of Caligula to erect a statue of himself in the temple at Jerusalem will, uh, may have fur, uh, fur, furnished a trait for Paul's delineation of the future deceiver. The fearful impiety of this outburst had sent a profound shock throughout Judaism, which should, uh, which would be felt by Jewish Christians as well. But when, when they're talking about Caligula might have been the Antichrist, not everything else was lined up as it is right now. It simply wasn't. So, and then verse four it says, uh, "Let me check my scriptures here." Yeah, we're in verse four still. He says. He sits in, he senses God in the temple. Okay, the specific ancient Greek word for temple indicates most holy place and not the temple as a whole. It is not that he enters the temple precincts. He invades the most sacred place and there he takes his seat. His action is itself a claim to deity. This is the ultimate blasphemy that results in certain judgment, the abomination of desolation spoken of by both Daniel and Jesus. Hasn't happened yet. The prophet Daniel told us the Antichrist will break his covenant with the Jews and bring sacrifice and offerings to an end that the Antichrist will defile the temple by setting something abominable there. Hasn't happened yet. Daniel 9.27, Daniel 11.31, and Daniel 12.11. Can you see that some of these teachings going out don't line up with the Word of God? Six seal being opened, great tribulation already started, you know, all this. It's impossible to happen. We're going line by line. We're, we're heading only to, to verse 5. Jesus said to look for an abomination standing in the holy place, which would be the pivotal sign that the season of God's wrath was upon the earth. So in, in Matthew 24, 15 and 16, and Matthew 24, 21, Jesus gave a pivotal sign that God's wrath had happened was when that the abomination was standing in the holy place. And that hasn't happened yet. Therefore, we're not in God's wrath. Therefore, uh, therefore, we're, uh, we are not in the six seals. We're not in the wrath. This stuff hasn't happened yet. And when it does, woe unto this world. It's impossible for it to happen according to the prophet Daniel and Jesus himself. Showing himself that he is God. The Antichrist is going to show and pretend that he's the Messiah. Okay. 
The man of sin, sin is truly an anti-Christ. Satan has planned the career of the man of sin to mirror the ministry of Jesus. The plan of the Antichrist is to mirror the ministry of Jesus. He's a counterfeit. Because both, watch this, both Jesus and the Antichrist have a quote, coming, a coming. 2 Thessalonians 2.1 and 2 Thessalonians 2.9, where we're not at there yet. Both Jesus and the man of sin have a revealing, 2 Thessalonians 1.7 and 2.3. Both Jesus and the man of sin have a gospel, 2 Thessalonians 2.10 and 11. Both Jesus and the man of sin say that they alone should be worshipped, 2 Thessalonians 2.4. Both Jesus and the man of sin have support uh, their claims with miraculous works, Jesus and the man of sin both perform miracles, 2 Thessalonians 2.9. Clearly, the man of sin is Satan parody of the true Messiah. I'm going to say that again. The man of sin is Satan's parody of the true Messiah. Yet in the end, the man of sin can only show himself that he is God. The coming of Jesus and the judgment of God will make it very clear that the man of sin is not God at all, but an imposter. Hallelujah to the living God. And everybody say amen. He's not God. He's a wannabe. So let's go down to verse 5 through 8 and let's discuss what restrains the coming of this man of sin. What right now is restraining the Antichrist? I'm going to read uh, 5 through 8. Remember ye not that I was uh, yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know that what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed and then shall that wicked be revealed whom the lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming and everybody say amen and for those who like the greek let's read it in the greek amplified five through eight do you not remember that when i was still with you i was telling you these things and you know what restrains him from now for what restrains him, just so we're clear on this, what restrains the Antichrist from being fully revealed is what we're talking about here. It is so that he will be revealed at his own appointed time. There is an appointed time for the Antichrist to be fully revealed. And that time has not happened yet. Seven, for the mystery of lawlessness. And it here's how it defines lawlessness in the Greek as it was written. Rebellion against divine authority and the coming reign of lawlessness. So it's a rebellion against God, godly authority. And it says it's already at work, but it is restrained only. Now watch this. The Antichrist is restrained only until he who now restrains it is taken out of the way. So something is restraining the Antichrist right now so he cannot be fully revealed. So let's see what the Word of God says is restraining him. Not our opinions and stuff like that, but the Word of God. Eight, then the lawless one, the Antichrist, the lawless one is the Antichrist, will be revealed. Then, after, make, take note of this, after the restrainer stops restraining, then the Antichrist will be revealed. And the Lord Jesus will slay him with the breath of his mouth and bring him to an end by the appearance of his coming. Check this out. Just the very words of Christ can destroy Satan. <laughs> but it's not time. So don't live in fear. The very words of Jesus will destroy Satan. So let's go back to our study of 5 through 8. Paul, Paul was only with the Thessalonians a few weeks. And this is recorded in Acts 17. But Paul thought it important to teach these brand new Christians about Bible prophecy. And he taught them in detail. And this is recorded in Acts 17. The Bible interprets the Bible. 
And you know what is restraining. For now, Satan and the man of sin are being restrained. For now. The principle of their working is now present. So, although they're being restrained, the spirit of the Antichrist has always been out there working. The mystery of lawlessness is already at work, it said. Even though the Antichrist, remember, defined as an individual, is being restrained, his spirit is already at work in the world. But at the right appointed time, the Holy Spirit, now listen, because this is where I got, this is why I've waited two weeks to do this, because this is like a mind-blown wow thing. The Holy Spirit, the, the restrainer, who restrains their full revelation will be taken out of the way. But there's more to it than that. So the Holy Spirit is the restrainer. It's very clear. Now listen to this. It, it says, we, 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 we should not think that the Holy Spirit will leave the earth during the Great Tribulation. I'm going to say that again. We should not think that the Holy Spirit will leave the earth during the Great Tribulation. He will be present on the earth during the Great Tribulation because many are saved, sealed, and will serve God during this period. Scriptural reference, Revelation 7 3 through 14 and Revelation 14 1 through 5 Bible interpreting the Bible and this cannot happen without the ministry of the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit now watch this the Holy Spirit is taken out of the way not removed there's the difference the Holy Spirit is taken out of the way not removed there's a difference Now, now listen to this. I'm gonna, we're going to go deep on this. Everybody ready to go deep? The phrase is used of any person or thing which is taken out of the way, whether by death or other removal. Some see this as the end of dispensation. The special presence of the Holy Spirit as the indweller of Christians like you and I. Watch this. The special presence of the Holy Spirit that is indwelling in us right now in this fellowship chat room will abruptly at the parousia end just as it abruptly began at Pentecost. So when you saw the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on an appointed time that Jesus gave, he said, go and tarry in the upper room and I'll meet you there. And it didn't happen immediately. It happened on Jesus' timetable. The appointed time, the Holy Spirit was poured out and the church was birthed. And, it's, and it records that it's going to leave the same way. I'm going to put this word in here. And I want people to research this because it really helped me a lot. This is a Greek word. Study that word, parousia. Once the body, now listen. You ready for this? Praise you, Lord Jesus. Once the body of Christ has been caught away to heaven, the Spirit's ministry will revert back to what he did for believers during the Old Testament period. So, just to let you know that the church will be removed. The, church, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in the church of Philadelphia, the faithful church in Revelation 4, has to be removed for the, the restrainer to be fully revealed. And it's not in the Great Tribulation. Is everybody with me on this? I mean, we get so caught up in YouTube teachings. My God, that how do we, how do we even stay sane? <laughs> I know I, I, I keep it real, but you know, it, real recognizes real. I'm on here to just tell you the truth. So it says the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Now look, this is a great principle of evil and it's been present in the world and it will ultimately be unveiled in the man of sin. So when the man of sin is ultimately fully revealed, you're going to see lawlessness like never before, not like what we're seeing now. But he does not introduce a new wickedness into the world. Only the same old prior wickedness. He has nothing new. He's not a creator. He's the created. All you're going to see is more evil from Satan. But it'll be unrestrained. He won't have new things. Because he's a created being. 
The same old lying devil. Pray for me, saints. You know, pray for me, seriously. Pray for me. I don't like speaking out about, uh, you know, uh, deities, you know, and my mom warned me on that. You know, I'm not ignorant in that manner. So I plead the blood of Jesus. Right now, this lawlessness is a mystery. That it is, it can, oh, now listen to this. The mystery of the lawlessness is that it can only be understood by Holy Spirit revelation. Quote that. Otherwise, it is hidden. It is not open sin and wickedness, but disassembled piety, specious errors, and wickedness under a form of a uh, under a form of godliness, cunningly managed. And then the lawless one will be revealed. The apostle Paul, through the Holy Spirit, writes: There's two certain facts about the man of sin, the Antichrist. Here called the lawless one. Here's two. 100% biblical facts about the Antichrist. First, it is certain that the lawless one will be revealed only when the Holy Spirit removes his restraint, only then. And second, it is certain that the lawless one will be destroyed by the brightness of Jesus at his coming. So, one thing is the Holy Spirit can't... The, the Holy Spirit will stop restraining, and, and the Holy Spirit is in all of us right now. How many people here feel the Holy Spirit? I am. Well, when we are removed, the Holy Spirit will be fully revealed because because uh, the church, really full of the Holy Spirit, is not restraining anymore, but the Holy Spirit will still be in operation in the Great Tribulation. This is what this says. And, and that the, at the, the, the second coming, notice that the church is removed. Where are they removed? They're caught up in the clouds to be with Jesus. They, they prayed they, to be counted worthy to escape what was coming. Jesus kept his promise and, and, and we met him in the clouds. But then Jesus is coming back a second time. That's the day of the Lord, not the rapture. We're not here for the day of the Lord. And when, when Jesus comes back, it's to destroy Satan. Do you understand? The, if you have fear issues right now, I pray for you. Because the Holy Spirit has risen me up to have strength to do this today. If you have fear issues, what you need to know every night when you lay your head to bed at night is that Satan's future is already written. There's a place for him to go. There's angels to take him there. And Jesus has already told you that he will crush him with his very words. So don't let the, the Satan get you upset on things. He's going to hell. It's written already. And I want to quote Isaiah 11.4. Now Isaiah, if anybody could put that in the chat box, listen. Isaiah 11.4 says, He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. That's Jesus talking. And with the breath of his lips, he shall slay the wicked. You know what he's talking about? Jesus destroying the Antichrist way back in Isaiah 11.4. The man of sin will be utterly destroyed by Jesus Christ himself. So let's look at some of the characters and strategies of the Antichrist. It says, the coming of the lawless one is according to the works of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Okay, so let me pause. We're going to do this in order. I don't care how long it takes. I am now in chapter 9. Uh, I say chapter a lot. I'm sorry. I'm in verse 9 through 12. I'm going to read three scriptures at a time. I'm going to read 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 12. Please stay with me. And then we're going to break that down line by line. And this is what it says. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Doesn't sound good, does it? But let's break it down, see what it says. In the Greek, again, parallel. The coming, verse 9, the coming of the Antichrist, the lawless. This is how it re reads in Greek. Coin Greek, by the way. One is through the activity of Satan. Attended with great power. And then it says all kinds of 
counterfeit miracles. You see, they're not real Jesus miracles. They're counterfeit miracles. There's that, huh? And deceptive signs and false wonders, and all of them will be lies. We got to remember that people are picturing this Antichrist and power working uh, miracles and wonders. They're false wonders, and he's a liar. Let's never forget that Jesus said he was a liar and the murderer from the beginning. He's a liar. He's a counterfeit. He's only trying to be like Christ, but he's not Christ. He's roaming around uh, like a lion or as a lion, but Jesus is the lion. There's a difference. Some people are serving on the losing team. I pray for their soul today. In uh, verse 10, and by unlimited seduction, see how it's so focused on deception and Jesus Christ warned us of deception way in advance. Take heed, no man deceived you, he said. When asked about the signs of his coming, he said deception, big time. And verse 10 in the Greek, and by unlimited seduction to evil and with all the deception of wickedness for those who are perishing or for those who are dying. Now here's the key here. They did not welcome the love of the truth of the gospel so as to be saved. They were spiritually blind and rejected the truth that would have saved them. In other words, they missed it. Did everybody catch that? The church is gone. The restrainer's in power. The great tribulation has happened. He's mimicking Christ. And yet people here are perishing because they rejected the truth. The church is not mentioned here. The people who rejected the, the Christ are. Nowhere in here does it mention a believer. It mentions unbelievers who rejected Christ that are left behind. They go into the great tribulation. According to the word of God. Not the believers, the unbelievers, the rebellious. I continue to do these Bible studies and continue to be amazed. Verse 11. And because of this, God will send upon them a misleading influence. God's not sending the strong delusion on the believer. He's sending the strong delusion on those who rejected Christ. To believe in Satan. Satan. Turning them over to reprobate mind, not us. Man, I feel good. So, so they will believe the lie. Now let's go line by line. I just want to uh, share this part. It's been an hour. Let's break this down. If someone has spiritual power, signs and wonders that the Antichrist will operate in, in uh, Revelation 13, clearly it says this, uh, they are not enough to prove that they came from God. That's not to operate. I'm going to say that again. To operate in power and signs and wonders is not enough to prove that that came from God. Satan can perform his own powerful works either through deception. There's the key word again. Or through his own resources of power. And then it says among those who perish. The deception, now listen to this, please. The deception coming through the Antichrist after he arises to power can only take, the, take root in those who, quote, do not receive the love of the truth. These people are ready for the deception of the Antichrist because they want a lie. They want to believe a lie. They're waiting for a lie. They don't want to hear the truth. They don't want to believe the truth. They want to mock the truth. Therefore, God will allow them to believe a lie. God, it says, will send them a strong delusion. Not the obedient people waiting for Christ to return, the ones rejecting the truth. In the end, the Antichrist is only another messenger of God. Look, here, here it is. God has judgment to bring. And he will send a strong delusion. It will come through the Antichrist. And God will not force this delusion on anyone but only those who do not receive the love of the truth, those are the ones who will receive the strong delusion. And, and this is why us indwelled Holy Spirit believers cannot be here through this. Does everybody get this? It's impossible. It's impossible. It doesn't line up with the Word of God. How could we be here 
full of the Holy Spirit, operating in the Holy Spirit gifts of God promised by Jesus and be deceived by the Antichrist. It, it doesn't say that. It says on those who rejected Christ. That they should believe a lie. Specifically, God sends them the lie. And it just isn't any lie. This is the lie. The lie is that uh, has, uh, has enthralled the human race since Adam. This is the lie that God is not God. This is the lie that the Antichrist will bring. And we won't be here, church. God is not God that we can all be gods. That's the lie he's going to promote. God isn't God. We're all gods. That's the lie he's going to... Uh, that is the lie. They will believe a lie. What lie? That God is not God. He will be profane and blasphemous. And then it says that they all may be condemned. Now notice, Romans 8.1 I'm just flowing in the Holy Spirit now. It says, There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the according to, of the flesh, but after the Spirit. It says, That they will all be condemned who do not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So the ones being condemned and believing the lie are the ones who rejected the truth. As God gives rebellious man the lie he desires, it isn't out of his generosity. Instead, it shows God's judgment on those who rejected the truth. And Romans 1 points out this God giving man up to the depravity of his heart. In, in Romans 1, it also says they took pleasure in their unrighteousness. Who? The ones that were trying to get out of Egypt. The ones running from Pharaoh. Instead of worshiping uh, God and his commandments, they built a golden calf and worshiped this. Do you see? This is where people aren't making this up. It's backed by the word of God. They worshiped a golden calf that they made. They melted down all of their gold and worshiped a calf rather than obey God's commandments. It's a repeat. He's going to come down and demand that you worship him. Who? Not Christian believers operating in obedience. Non-believers operating in disobedience. So I want to give you some encouragement. Is everybody clear on this timeline? I want to give you some encouragement now. We're going to go to verse 13 and 14. It says, but we are bound. So, so now he gives all this news to the church because it's not for them it's to it's to it's to answer their questions that they that in second Thessalonians they thought they'd been left behind and there's some probably people here today on this earth they thought they'd been left behind too he wanted to assure them that that's not how it goes and he quotes Daniel and he quotes Jesus in the spirit of prophecy and he quotes Romans he quotes all of these other chapters of the Bible to prove that what they were believing was false. And now he wants to encourage them. And that's what Sunday's message is on encouragement. It says, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit, Holy Spirit, and belief of the truth. So God has chosen us that are going to be raptured to be sanctified and, and chosen us for salvation because of our belief in the truth in the Holy Spirit. That's verse 13. 14. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, verse 15, therefore, brethren, that's brothers and sisters in Christ, that's us here in the room, stand fast and hold the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or or our epistle and what I could say right now in comparison is look don't believe someone on YouTube got a word from the Lord that the sixth seal is open or the rapture is during great tribulation because God didn't say that stand fast and hold on to the gospel of Jesus Christ and the epistles which are are the word of God hold stand fast in the truth stand fast in in righteousness don't believe what's being taught outside of the word of God anywhere no matter where you may be in the world 
Social media is taking over the world. Don't fall into that deception. Stand fast in the word of God. In 16, in closing, in closing, it says, Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself, Jesus, 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 and God, our Father, which has loved us and has given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Close out and worship again. I feel the Holy Spirit all over me, saints. What I want to say here is, and this is just yet another uh, Bible study proof that Jesus can come at any time. Jesus can come like a thief. We don't need to see the Antichrist standing in Jerusalem for us to leave. It said it'll happen just, just as quickly as it happened when the Holy Spirit was poured out in Acts 2. And the church was born, the outpouring, this is that, the outpouring. As quickly as that happened, the same will it be when the church is caught up before great tribulation. Before great tribulation. The church is instantly going to be out of here. How? Caught up. Harpozo. Harpozo means snatched away, caught away. Some people say the rapture in the Bible. It's all throughout the Bible. Snatched up, caught up taken to Jesus, and then all these things happen. Jesus could come tonight. He don't need anybody's permission to, to, to come. He's waiting on the trumpet to blow. For God said, go get my people. He's waiting, and he's waiting. It can happen anytime. And after that, after the church is caught up, then all of these things will begin. After the restrainer stops restraining the Holy Spirit and is indwelling in us, and we're caught up, then all this stuff can happen. So I ask you today to ponder this as you go into the weekend. Take a look around at everything that's happening in the world, worldwide, and ask you, are we heading to that? And if your answer is yes, simply repent, get right with Jesus, and hold on and do what it says. Stand fast and stay in the word and do not be deceived or be a lie because we do not go into great tribulation. We go into the clouds. Hallelujah. And that's according to the word of God. Holy Spirit. I feel something breaking off of me, you know. What has this world got for us? Just give me Jesus. Give us Jesus. Lord Jesus, I ask that you bless everybody in this room right now. Touch their heart. Make us more aware. Let us feel your presence. Let us experience your glory. Lord, one more time. One more time, let us feel you. As we await for you, strengthen us. Pour into us. We receive. Play this song and just close out and worship. I love you all. You know, I'm all here for the love. We're going home, saints. We're going home. <laughs> and then, you know what? After we're gone, it doesn't matter what happens. We're not here. I love you all. God bless you, Sister Crystal and Karen and everybody in the room, Cheryl, Jody, Noah, I, uh, Jawadi. I'm going to read all these. I'm going to go ahead and close out. I'm tell, I don't know about you, but I'm caught up in the presence of the Lord. And you know what? It's when, have you noticed? It's when we come together like this. It's when we come together like this. It's like the Holy Spirit is all in us and amongst us. The Holy Spirit is in us and, and dwelling amongst us. And it's like we got 70 people here. That's how many people were sent out. 70, it's a sign. Jesus sent out 70 people. And they all returned with great joy and victory. That The, 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 the demons were subject to their name. And he said, don't glory that, you're, that the demons are subject to your name, but glory in the fact that I have written your name in the book of life. Where is that book? It's in the book of Revelation. 
Our names are written there. We can stand there and we can plead our place before Him and say, it's through you that we got here, Jesus. It's for what you did and not we did. It's through your grace and mercy. Hold on, saints. Hold on, saints. I'm telling you as a watchman, I feel it. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. I'm not going to focus on what the Antichrist does in Jerusalem. I'm going to focus on the return of my King. And I want to see you all there with me. Hallelujah. Keep me in prayer. Keep my wife in prayer. The enemy don't like me. I'm telling you. But that's okay. You know what? I, I count that as a blessing. If the enemy does like you, then you need, <laughs> you need prayer. The enemy, he don't like us. So let's keep all of each other in prayer. Amen. Keep us in your prayer. We'll keep you in prayer. I'm, I, I don't know if you know this, but we're on our third day of fasting and praying here. And I'm just thankful for everybody here. I'm thankful that we can gather together and speak the truth in love without offense. See you Sunday. Sunday, 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. A church on encouragement. It's hard for it's hard for me to, to stop and shut it down. <laughs> I just I feel the anointing, you know. Help us, Lord. We love you, we love you, Yahweh. Nothing but the truth. All we're doing is reading and quoting the Word of God. Woohoo! We're reading and quoting the Word of God. I feel like I could fly out of here right now. The Lord knows I'm ready. <laughs> Trust me. The Lord knows. <laughs> the Lord knows. God bless you all.